Hello and good morning. It's Liverpool Live. It's Wednesday. It's February the 16th, 10 past 11. It is with me, Roy Bassnett. Uh, my next guest, actually, it's worked out quite well, this really, because it's very rare that I get to meet somebody for the first time. And we have a, a load of friends in common with each other. We have a mutual love of rugby league. Uh, so th- th- this is starting on a good foot, this, right? It's Phil Cooper from the NHS. Hello, Phil. Uh, good morning, Roy. Yeah, it's uh, great stuff and, uh, yeah, massive interest in sport. But, yeah, always good to chew over the fat around witness and there. Uh, Successful start to the season. Indeed, absolutely. Well, first of all, let, let's have your, your full title as to what you do, what your role is within the NHS. I, well, I work in Mersey Care and I work as a nurse consultant, which is quite a senior position. Um, my work is usually with people with most severe mental health and drug and alcohol problems. Right. And unfortunately, that is a, an ongoing service because this is something that is, you know, we've just had a pandemic of COVID-19, but there's a, almost a pandemic as well of these problems, aren't there? Yeah, unfortunately, we've seen quite a big rise, about 20% rise in people being referred for mental health and depending on which study you read and research you read around alcohol consumption, that seems to have uh, increased quite a little bit in, in different ways, some more spirits and wine rather than beer in pubs because yeah. pubs were shut. But yeah, unfortunately, yeah, lots of it about and very, very common to have mental health and use alcohol. Off the, off the back of it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. unfortunately. So... Coming back to the pandemic, there are mm. a lot of people who, you know, were, you know, confined to barracks, if you like, during the course of that, actually saw some kind of, like, you know, pleasure from drinking alcohol. Has that proved to be a problem? Has it exasperated an already existing one? I, th- uh, I think I think it's just changed people's habits to a certain degree, because mm. most beer was consumed within pubs, usually, so when that yeah. option's not available, people sort of change. They'll either buy it from a supermarket, perhaps, but... There's been an increase in more wine and spirits being consumed. So, so again, whether that will have a bigger impact over a period of time, we'll, we'll probably have to wait and see. Yeah. As, as obviously things are loosening up right now, uh, you probably need to sort of keep an eye on whether people go, do continue to go back to pubs. Will they go back with a vengeance or will people just uh, drink at home more and more, yeah. which is potentially a hidden problem. So not yeah. all people may. I, th- I think it's, it's, it's probably a better thing from a health point of view that, people return to the pubs because at least you're in a regulated environment there there's nobody curtailing your activity in the home place mm-hmm. um, and I suppose it's difficult really because you know you, you're quite right about the spirits I mean yeah your lagers and all that and your beers and your bitters has been around obviously like everything has been around for a while but if you look at the spirits now they're being made more kind of almost like refreshing beverages as opposed to like you know a shot of drama whiskey years down and stuff like that and you look at gin there's a million and one flavours of gin and they all taste pretty nice you know that's a difficult thing to combat that really isn't it yeah very much so again obviously it's a you know it's a it's a market so people will try and sell as much of their product as possible really so yeah. making it attractive in many many ways but yeah so that's a, a potential possible place in which uh, alcohol consumption can increase but mm. Hopefully not to do so. Maybe it just might just change the way in which we yeah. consume and change our habits over the long term. Indeed. So is, is there a typical cycle, for example, that somebody has some bad news, maybe they lose the job, they split up in a relationship, they immediately go into alcohol and then, I mean, is, is there a common denominator in this? I think every human sort of unique, really, so there'll be a, a unique set of sim- circumstances for every person in whatever their circumstances are. So whether that's a history of difficulties or not, uh, losing a job is a big thing. Obviously, we've got uh, lots of people have been working from home, which is a change yeah. from that sort of routine. So you have lots of different sort of rationales. I think you, you touched on it really, really well then uh, around people drinking at home. With, you know, People may begin to drink a glass of wine or a couple of glasses of wine, and then it becomes a bottle of wine every night. Yeah. So, so potentially that uh, can easily become... A regular, regular thing. So, uh, and well, I don't. I don't. Oh, God, sorry. So, no, no, no. Just, just so we can get an angle on that. You know, if you were doing a bottle of wine and like, you got a problem there, really. I'm not turning around and say you, you're going to be the next Oliver Reed, but obviously that's more than what you should be doing. Maybe the odd glass here with your with your food. I kind of understand it. Um, when would you say? Well, it, it, where, where's the kind of borderline here? If you was, if somebody was saying, look, I like a drink. What kind of level should I be drinking? How many units or whatever? And put that into some kind of context for us. Yeah, certainly we'll do. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the recommended u- units of alcohol, one unit of alcohol is about half a pint of 3.6% alcohol by volume. So it's the strength of the alcohol if you're drinking a beer, for example. If you're drinking a bottle of wine, you will probably consume between 9, 10 units per bottle. Uh, right. Purely and simply because... Uh, you know, the strength of the wine is stronger than uh, 
that it's in beer. So, uh, so 14 units is the recommended uh, dose. If you, you any of your listeners are, are know somebody who's drinking a little bit to excess, I can do a very simple uh, screen for that for people to think about if they're while they're listening. So. Right. Uh, if you're happy for me to do that. Sure. One, yeah, yeah, definitely. 100%. Yeah. So, so if you are listening and you know someone who, who has an alcohol issue or you think they may have a problem, perhaps, then uh, these four questions are a bit of an indication, really, of what, what's happening. So the first one is, do you know somebody who's perhaps been trying to cut down their alcohol use? And it's just a yes or no answer, really. Mm. Uh, secondly, uh, whether you know someone who gets annoyed or angry at people who have a go or criticise their drinking. Again, just yes or no. Thirdly, uh, whether people feel guilty about things they've done whilst under the influence of alcohol. Again, yes or no. Mm. I don't mean a, an occasional yeah. thing yeah. from the past. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, everyone's got one of those examples. And finally, whether uh, you know people have a drink first thing in the morning to get themselves going, mm. you know, after a heavy session, for example. And again, just yes or no. Now, I, I'll go all technical on you here now. So that's a cage yeah. alcohol assessment, uh, very reliable and uh, you know research based. They reckon two yes answers are a pretty good indication of a potential alcohol problem. Right. But again, you've got to keep that in context, of course. So if you had a drink first thing in the morning, you're on a hen night or a stag do, for example, then that's different from that happening on a regular yeah, basis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it was one of those things that you were using alcohol to kickstart your day. Yeah, absolutely. So, so again, it's just a, a quick way to think about it. So, I, I, and in my world in health, that's called a brief intervention. So you ask the question, let people think about it, and then move on, so to speak. Mm. So mm. Uh, they'll think about it themselves. So. Right, I see. So when it is the case that, you know, some people are answering yes to maybe more than just mm. a couple there, then you could, you, you kind of identify and there's a little bit of an issue. What's the next step after that? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the first step for, for any sort of situation, if you think there's a, an issue there, is maybe maybe speaking to your GP, there are lots of services that are available across like Merseyside, so uh, there are lots of things, that, and what they'll probably do is maybe do a quick assessment just like I've done there, so if you ever rock up to A&E or a GP, a lot of GPs will know that, those mm. particular questions, and that'd be like a trigger to say, do you need any further help, you know, what's the current situation for yourself, yeah. Yeah. and then make a judgment based on that, whether... People can do that on their own with a bit of self-help, perhaps, mm. but also maybe might just need a little bit of extra support. Yeah. See, here's, here's the thing. When you've got someone who is uh, an alcoholic, if you like, and, you know, weaning somebody off who's an alcoholic is, is, a, is something very difficult to do, and it's, and it's not a quick fix. What about people who are not necessarily alcoholics, but have that little kind of dependency um, to kind of, you know, to, to just to keep, you know, they, they, they don't have to be constantly drinking, but just a little Kickstarter. Uh, how do you get beyond that? Okay, well, well, well it's, it's pretty specific, really. So, so the, the term alcoholic is quite a general sort of broad term that's probably mm. not used uh, as often these days. However, so, so people look at uh, whether people are drinking relatively okay, no problem whatsoever. Is there some sort of harmful level? So maybe just getting above your 14 units a week, mm. then is it getting hazardous? When is, it, is that the allowance the per, per week, 14 units? Yeah, indeed. So that, that effectively, uh, as I've read that situation, that would be like the equivalent of having seven pints over the course of the week. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or maybe of, a of around about 3.6, four, four pints. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and they also recommend not to perhaps do that in one, one, one session yeah. sort of thing mm. and do it over two or three if that's possible. But then you're getting into the realms of, you know, when you in, your consumption goes above that, you're into like a hazardous alcohol consumption. And then when you, you touched on it yourself around dependence, so that's when you're probably in those sort of realms of uh, drinking on a relatively regular basis, the, the levels or the units of alcohol are quite high, so maybe three, four, five times, and I've seen many more times than that, yeah. those recommended units. And then people will be drinking, but when they stop drinking, then they'll begin to withdraw from those. Mm. You know, some of those withdrawal symptoms can be quite horrendous. Yeah. And when you link it to mental health as well, um, lots of people may use alcohol to try and manage their anxiety or low mood, perhaps. But unfortunately, when the alcohol wears off, it will magnify those yeah. anxiety and depression symptoms. I've noticed this myself um, because, you know, I, I've kind of, you know, I've always been a drinker throughout the course of my life. Um, ne never to an alcoholic point, but certainly a drunk a lot. And I'll mm -hmm. admit that. I'm not one of these. You know, if somebody asks me what I drink, I will tell them in honesty yep. what I drink. And certainly years ago, when I was younger, I could deal with it. But I tend to find that the following day now, is not only the, oh God, I can't be bothered, the, the lethargy that comes in off the back of having a hangover, but the world seems a worse place as a result of it. And like what you've just said there, mm -hmm. when, you, when you, you're coming off the kind of effects, the high effects, if you like, that you get off that the, the lows are particularly low aren't they uh, they certainly can be for some people without a doubt and again i think that's why it's um 
although people might think it's a short-term fix to feel a little bit better and that's the reason most people tend to drink uh, to feel a bit better uh, then it's the consequences of that unfortunately because yeah. if there's a particular issue or a range of issues that are in the background then those issues are still there when you you sober up next day and feeling lethargic and then perhaps magnified symptoms and then yeah. the ability to deal with it becomes even more difficult because yeah. of that lethargy not being able to what about the equation between men and women on this is, is there any particular gender sorry any particular sex that's kind of you know out in front yeah i think i think historically men were predominantly uh, mm. uh bigger drinkers however over the last say 10 years or so there's probably been an increase in younger females drinking uh yeah. and drinking higher amounts of alcohol as well and I suppose the difficulty for any sort of high consumption is the vulnerability that we, you know, you're placed in, your inhibitions yeah. are reduced, all of those things. You know, you put yourself in perhaps more compromising or dangerous situations than you mm. would do previously. But yeah, I think um, it's, it's historically more males than females, but that, that's sort of changing over time. Yeah. Okay, we're going to talk about some of the more positive aspects of uh, health and well-being in uh, in a few minutes' time. You are listening to Liverpool Live, and I'm pleased to be joined in the studio from Mersey Care by Phil Cooper. More coming up from him. Don't forget, if there's a question you would like to me to put to Phil on your behalf, then please feel free to offer that up to me. Send it in a, num in a number of ways. You can uh, send us a text message. Start your message with the word SCOUSE, followed by what you want to say. Send it over to double eight double four zero, or you can email me directly, studio at liverpoolliveradio.com. True Blue from Madonna here on Liverpool Live. It's just coming up to half past 11. Phil Cooper's my guest in the studio from Mersey Care. Where we're talking about, so well, we've been talking about alcohol, and we're going to talk about mental well, well-being now. And interestingly enough, as I say, when we were having that off, off air conversation and I mentioned about the rugby league player Terry Newton, who took his life, um, that was a catalyst for your kind of, um, your, your projects really, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, a very tragic event. And um, from that particular incident taking place, I remember reading a sports paper on the Monday morning uh, after that incident had taken place. Someone had written an article and someone had written a letter to the same uh, paper, basically saying how the NHS and rugby league or sport rugby league should get together to try and prevent, you know, sort of tragedies happening, so to try and prevent people taking their own life if possible. Mm. So from that particular moment on, I suppose, I suppose I'm a bit sad from the NHS point of view, big rugby league fan, so um, I was trying to work out how, A, we could, put that into practice but also get all the autographs of all the players that I like to see so mm. uh, so, so I met with the, these guys who'd written to the paper and then they got Brian Carney Sky Sports presenter yeah, uh, who played in the same team as Terry and yeah. Terry O'Connor who you, you, you'd mentioned earlier on in our, in our conversation uh, and we were thinking about NHS wise to have a bit of a conference but we were, they said well why don't you link in to the, the, the governing body and ask them if they'll give you a round of fixtures uh, themed around mental fitness or improving mental fitness. Mm. So it's great for the Rugby Football League's point of view, they agreed to do that. So we, we, we delivered that over about nine or ten years, which is great. But what, what we wanted to do is, A, we delivered a session, a mental fitness session to players, mm. touched on alcohol, as we did before, did exactly the same yeah. assessment with them. Uh, and... Uh, I found myself in a position where uh, we could have a round of fixtures if we, if the chief execs of all the Super League clubs uh, approved the session that I was going to deliver. Yeah, yeah. So I found myself being driven over to Hull by Brian and presented to all the chief execs. They said yes. And then uh, we had a massive opportunity to improve mental fitness for players, of course, by delivering a session, hence the mm -hmm. autograph sheets that I still have, uh, but also to get to fans and communities around mm -hmm. uh, sport. And, and rugby league is one sport amongst many, and we, we work in football as well as yeah. rugby union and cricket But since that time. But yeah, uh, mental fitness is crucial. But we, we started to think about men initially, I guess, because at that time, 10 years ago, I, I, I saw Wayne Rooney in the yeah, last couple of weeks yeah, talking about yeah, indeed, yeah. how he would yeah. never have spoken about it 15 years ago whereas hopefully things have changed massively in that time mm. so, so I think uh, the opportunity to use sport to help people be mentally fitter yeah uh, I know Roy you will watch witness and that may have a different impact on your yeah. mental fitness depending on how things are going mm. uh, and the same if you support any football team as you've been supporting Everton for the first half of the season hopefully things yeah. will be much more positive for the second mm. but those type of things those interests that we all have can either improve our mental fitness and if we don't feel so good or our mental health isn't as good as it usually is then we stop doing the things that we enjoy doing and you mm. know crucially 
whatever that is, going for a walk, walking the dog, I don't know, having a bath, soaking your feet in a bowl of water whilst watching whatever your favourite comedy is. Mm. All those things are crucial to keep us as well as possible. So. Yeah, yeah. Listen, mate, unfortunately we're out of time, uh, but I think we need to revisit this because we've only scratched the surface of the subject uh, and it's marvellous. And, and just so you know as well, because I mean, you know, you from Warrington, Indeed. I'm from Witness, you might think I'm a bit bitter. I did do Benny Westwood's testimonial. I did some <laughs> st stuff on that and I, I actually interviewed. Do you remember when Paul Wood... Um, and I do apologise for saying this, but it, it is the case. He, he lost his testicle, didn't he, he did. uh, during the uh, the grand final? I interviewed him on the Monday after it, and it was live. And I wish I hadn't done it live. That's all I'm going oh, oh, <laughs> to say on it. Yeah, uh, Phil. Well, listen, we'll catch up with you again in the not too distant future. Uh, tell us if you would please uh, about resources that people can find online to get more information. Yeah, if, if you go into uh, merseycare.nhs.uk and you'll find loads of information on there. If you need any urgent care, same website forward slash urgent hyphen help. Or if you just need a bit of information about how you can get. Uh, mentally fit to yourself then again musicare.nhs.uk but uh, uh, help us help you uh, yeah. and that, that will hopefully help anyone who's listening today so Indeed. thanks for the opportunity it's been a pleasure no we shall look forward to your company next time thank you very much that's Phil Cooper from Mersey Care um, we shall make sure that we put stuff on our social media pages as well so you can find out more, more information that way so we take a break and we come back with Chef D